Um, well, thanks for inviting me. Thanks everyone for uh, showing up. This is actually, I said it a few times already, but this is quite exciting. Uh, I think that uh, this is the first talk I'm giving in over a year in which I'm required to wear pants. So <laughs> this is quite something. Uh, the new parts of these talks are based on uh, joint works with uh, Jacob Ohm, Valerie King, Mikkel Taub, and uh, Uwe Zvi. And as the title says, and they made it even a bit more broader than uh, what's written in the abstract, I'm going to talk about random subjects. So we'll get into that uh, very soon. Um, one thing regarding giving this uh, talk classroom physically, uh, I can probably not monitor the Zoom screen as much as uh, people usually can when they give uh, Zoom talks. So if people ask questions via Zoom, please try to do so uh, verbally. And if you see that someone has written something in the chat and I probably didn't acknowledge it because I'm not looking at the screen all the time, uh, okay, now there is a screen in the middle of the room, so you might <laughs> look at it. Uh, but I want to say that like, feel very free to just like uh, say people's, uh, other people's questions out loud. This, uh, this would be uh, very nice of you, and then I'll be able to read the question. Uh, on top of that, please stop me at any time point for uh, any question you have. Two hours is a uh, long time. There's no reason to, to lose people in the middle. Okay, so yeah, now my clicker didn't work. So what I'm going to talk about is this world of uh, sampling. This is uh, the starting point of uh, of this talk, uh, and sampling is a very important technique in uh, computer science. Actually, not only in computer science. It is used for uh, more than a few things. Maybe the most common of which which is actually more math than computer science, is for constructing stuff, for uh, lower bounds and so on. It is also very useful in the entire regime of approximate algorithms or probability testing, maybe the most uh, common framework of using uh, something in that sense, and um, in particular speaking about uh, graph sampling, because this is what we're going to discuss later in the talk, is some framework that looks like take your graph, keep only a small fraction uh, of the edges, of the nodes uh, in random, then solve the problem or solve some uh, variation of the problem on uh, that random subset and hope that this thing is a good enough approximation of whatever you, you tried to calculate on the original graph. Uh, and in more uh, rare occasions, but this is still happening, you can also use that to get exact algorithms uh, for stuff on I mean, that type of framework, usually by adding after this, uh, take a random subset, solve the problem on the small graph, adding another step of now take this approximate solution, par partial solution or anything you got and extend it somehow, fix it to be uh, an exact solution on the entire graph. We are going to see an example of uh, something like this later in the talk. And as already kind of mentioned and uh, probably evident from what I'm saying, this is tightly related to the combinatorial study of random graphs. So we are going to, to do like a, a quick uh, history of uh, random graphs. Uh, the, the course of the history I'm going to present is uh, very tilted towards what I'm, I'm going to, uh, to talk about. So uh, yeah, this is uh, kind of uh, spoiling the, the directions I'm, I'm going to go with. But we will uh, start with uh, what it's obvious we should start with. So the, the most uh, common, most uh, used model today of uh, random graphs is the Erdes-Schrenny um, model of random graphs from 59. Uh, we denote by GNP what we usually call just a random graph. You take n vertices and each possible edge is added with some probability p. And these things behave nicely. Now, 
The definition of behaving nicely is somewhat questionable, especially because nowadays we call many graph properties nice because uh, random graphs exhibit them, but there are things that, uh, that I assume that most people uh, would naturally agree that are nice, maybe uh, the most common of which, or and one of the things that is uh, most, uh, most extensively researched is the threshold phenomenon. So, as I assume most, if not all of us, uh, know there is this phenomenon in uh, Erdosheni random graphs, in which if you have a monotone graph property, there is some value of P, which you call a threshold for this property, such that if you take G and P with P that is much smaller than that, you are very, very likely to not have this property, and if you have G and P with P that is much larger than the threshold, you are very, very likely to have this property. And the first thing that was uh, studied regarding these random graphs, this is the first paper in which uh, Erdős and Rain introduced this model, is the threshold for connectivity. The value of P in which this graph becomes connected. So you might as well get overlap. Uh, yes, true. This is probably changing in, uh, in the next slide. I flipped at some point. Yeah, Avi is right. So the, for the threshold is like the natural uh, logarithm of uh, n over n. Uh, and it's good that you correct me because the next question is uh, why? I mean, I assume, uh, I, I assume that it's fine to ask this question because uh, m maybe almost all of us are familiar enough with that, but I want a very short answer. What, what makes uh, lan n over n the threshold for connectivity? Exactly. Like, uh, an excellent answer is an answer that appears on the next slide. So as uh, Jin Yang said, uh, the reason this is the threshold for connectivity is this is the, the point in which you start having isolated vertices. So uh, let's uh, spend one line on that just to, to make sure that uh, everyone do know that. So well, what happens here now? Uh, now the P flipped, <laughs> because I didn't change it in the previous slides. So what happens in, uh, in this uh, value of P is that the expected uh, number of uh, isolated vertices, uh, not the expected number, actually, the probability of having isolated vertices uh, starts uh, to decrease. You can see that the probability of a specific vertex to be isolated is 1 minus this threshold P, the probability of not having an edge to the number of edges coming out of it, and with our threshold this is uh, exactly 1 over n. So in expectation this is roughly where we, uh, where we don't expect having isolated vertices. And this is important because when you are looking at the proof for the threshold of connectivity, you see that the, uh, that the expected number and probability of having empty cuts that are larger than that, that have more than one uh, vertex in, uh, in one of the size, is negligible in comparison to the probability of having an empty cut in which one of the sides is just a single vertex. This is a very uh, elaborate way of saying an isolated vertex. And thus the bottleneck for uh, the strain graphs to, uh, to become connected is isolated vertices. You can actually show that the, the moment you stop having uh, isolated vertices is the exact same moment in which you, uh, the graph becomes connected. And, and that means that uh, Erdős Rainy graphs need roughly n log n edges to become connected. If we pick P that is uh, too small for that to happen, the graphs would not be connected. And this is uh, somewhat unfortunate because we know that you don't need more than n minus one edges to connect n vertices. So maybe we should go back a bit and think about alternative models. Now, this is not a, a general uh, suggestion uh, for life. This is uh, taking you towards where I want to take you with this talk. Um, but there are obviously alternative models for uh, generating random graphs, and when I was talking about uh, taking a step back and rethinking the model, this is actually taking many steps back. Uh, so 
the model I'm, I'm going to, to discuss right now was actually introduced much, much earlier than the Erdes Anyone? This was introduced in the Scottish book. Are people here familiar with what that is? Okay, so this is a nice talk, it's worth uh, mentioning. Uh, I don't remember the name of the university, and I probably wouldn't be able to pronounce it anyway, but there is a, a famous university in Poland in which uh, people like Ulam and Banach were working. And they and other mathematicians from the university and visitors to the university were spending many of the working hours in a local coffee house. I guess mathematicians didn't change that much in a hundred years. Uh, they set an example for all of us to follow. Yeah, true. Like, this, is, this is now what we have to do. I mean, otherwise, this would be disrespectful. Given, given the amount of mathematics that came out of this cafe, it's, I think it's a good example. Yeah, this is it's definitely a good example. So, they were working in this uh, coffee house. This coffee house was called the Scottish Cafe. This is the, the reason for the name the Scottish Book, even though they are Polish. And they used to just like scribble down their math on the tabletops in this cafe. They were like marble tabletops and they were like writing with pencils on top of them. And I guess this was annoying to the owner of the cafe. I mean, he didn't like people writing on his tables and also he had to um, erase everything in the end of every day. And they were annoyed that their math is being erased because how dare the owner of the coffee house erase his uh, tabletops. And then at some point, the wife of uh, Stephen Banach suggested an idea. She suggested that they would buy a big notebook or some notebooks and put them in the coffee house and just use them every time that, uh, that they are working there. So they got notebooks and put them in the coffee house for them and any other mathematician coming to use. And they started writing problems they didn't manage to solve in this, uh, in this notebook. So there, there became like a very long list of uh, problems written in this uh, Scottish cafe notebook and they even had like uh, prize problems in there. There are like stories about Banach giving a life boost to uh, someone uh, a few decades later because he solved some of the uh, problems in, uh, in, that, uh, in that book. And one problem written in this book it's uh, listed as problem number uh, 38. It was written by Ulam is the following. And I'm um, sorry for the unreadable font. This is how I assume people wrote down in the 30s. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, the, the problem was as follows. So let there be given n elements. He thought about them as uh, people, as persons. And to each element we attach k others among the, the entire n uh, elements in random. He thought about them as friends of that given person. Uh, and yes, what is the probability of every pair of people having this uh, directed uh, chain of, uh, of friends between them? So yeah, we can phrase it today as we construct a random directed graph by picking a k uniformly random outgoing edges out of each node, and we ask what is the probability that this thing is strongly connected, and by saying what is the probability, what I really care about is what is the threshold, like from which value of k this starts to, uh, to tend to 1 when n goes to infinity. Um, well, yeah, and, and Ulam maybe also as a, as a good mathematician uh, should, uh, didn't see the friendship relation as uh, symmetric, but uh, I don't want to, uh, to talk that much about uh, directed graphs because this is both more complicated and would not be generalizable to what I want to discuss next. So we're going to, uh, to mess up with uh, Ulam's problem a bit and make this undirected. Now we will just remove the directions of the edges in that graph. So now I'm constructing graph by still picking uh, k outgoing edges out of every node, but then I'm going to ignore their direction. Right, so I'm just like picking uh, k uh, incident edges for every, uh, for every vertex and then taking the union of all of them. And now what I care about is the threshold for connectivity for that problem. And this was solved not much uh, later. I mean, this variation of the problem by uh, no one else rather than Erdes. Actually, Erdes was the, the one uh, 
that is given the, the solution for this thing. He also didn't like the directions, so uh, he also made the graph undirected. And let's let's see uh, some uh, end wave uh, uh, proof of, of that thing. So for k equal, equals one, we still expect our variant of isolated vertices. Well, maybe I should go back and, and stress the important point. What's nice about this model in comparison to to the erdos rainy model, especially with the problem we have with, we have with connectivity in mind, is that here we don't have isolated vertices. Every vertex picks some incident edges, so it cannot be isolated. This kind of forces that nothing is isolated, which was the, the bottleneck there. And saying that, for k equals 1, we still have a problem. Why? We cannot have isolated vertices now, but we may still have isolated pairs. It could be that some vertex picks one uh, friend, this uh, friendly vertex picks uh, the same vertex back, and nobody else picks them. So the probability for that happening with a specific pair is roughly 1 over n squared. Right? This is the uh, probability in which this is going to happen, and there are roughly n squared uh, pairs, possible pairs of uh, vertices, so in expectation we would still have like some constant amount of uh, isolated pairs. So this is kind of like the uh, end wave reason why uh, k equals 1 is not enough. And um, please note that in many times throughout this talk I am ignoring constants, when I'm saying roughly 1 over n squared, I, I ignore the constant. Uh, it's usually written behind me, but not always. Uh, okay. But what about k equals 2? So here what's going to happen is that this graph would already be very likely to be connected. Why is that? Because we can consider any particular specific, um, any particular specific partition of the vertices. Let's say that there are r vertices in one side of the partition and n minus r the other side of the partition. We can also uh, assume that r is between k plus 1 to n minus k plus 1, because each vertex has k, uh, k neighbors, so it, uh, it couldn't be that, uh, that there would be any partition with uh, less than that. And actually, um, I care only about k equals 2, so ignore this k uh, for now, and let's ask what is the probability of any such specific partition to, to really separate the, the graph. So the probability for that is for each vertex in the left-hand side of this partition, the probability that both of the neighbors uh, it picked are not from all of the n minus 1 possible neighbors, but from the r minus 1 neighbors that are in the same part of this uh, bipartition as this uh, vertex. If this is uh, r minus 1 uh, choose 2 over n minus 1 choose 2. And this has to happen for all r vertices in this side of the partition. And the same thing has to happen for every vertex in the other side of the partition. Now with uh, n minus r minus 1 instead of uh, r minus 1. This is for the rest of the n minus r vertices. And this is roughly uh, r over n squared to the r, and this is roughly n minus r over n squared to the n minus r. Right, so all I did was uh, ignore that uh, this is like r minus 1, r minus 2 instead of r squared. But, uh, let's, uh, I hope you can forgive me for that. So this is roughly the thing. And what is the number of such partitions? The number of partitions of, of, that, uh, of that size, of uh, r vertices in one side and n minus r vertices in the other side, is n choose r. And this is uh, roughly, or at least bounded by, E n over r to the r. Right, uh, we are probably familiar with that approximation, otherwise this is basically like a Stirling approximation on the r factorial on the denominator, and uh, the n of n factorial over n minus r factorial would just don't like n to the r. So that's not much. So now, now we can just like multiply these things and see what is the expected number of partitions of that particular size that are uh, empty, that have no edges crossing them. So that would be something that is roughly that, like this, uh, this number of partitions times the probability that each uh, partition is empty, and this thing is small. 
you can see that this thing is, uh, is exponentially small in n for any r, let's say, between, uh, between uh, k and uh, k, which is 2, and uh, n over n, which is enough. I mean, this, uh, this approximation uh, of en over r to the r would not be good enough if uh, we pass the threshold of uh, r equals n over 2, but we don't need to do that because every partition is a smaller sign. So the, this thing is small even if we sum it up over all possible hours. So this is like the, the almost even not end wave reasoning for why for a k equals to this thing will be connected with a very high probability or probability that approaches one as a and goes to infinity. So this is nice, right? We now have a different model that is still quite, uh, quite natural. Uh, and I'll put like uh, I need to to go back to what I mean by uh, quite natural in a few seconds, uh, in, in which connectivity happens much faster. Now we need only two n edges in order for our random graph to, to become connected. We don't need n log n edges anymore. And what I meant by saying natural is that like the erdos Schrödinger model, this is also a model that we can uh, very efficient, efficiently implement. I mean, it's very easy to keep each edge with some constant probability. It is still very easy to let uh, each node uh, pick a random subset of uh, incident vertices. Other models that may be very nice but are not natural in the sense that, uh, that they are not very easy to implement are things like take a random k regular graph. This is something that, I mean, it is very natural mathematically to, to think about that. Um, and then we can even say a few words about what happens there. So for one regular graphs, obviously you are never connected. This is just like a magic. Um, random two regular graphs are also almost surely not connected because this is just a bunch of uh, cycles. So you are basically taking a random bunch of uh, partition to cycles and you ask if this is like the one cycle that covers everything or uh, or not, so it's also quite easy to show that uh, this is almost surely disconnected. But uh, three regular graphs, like if you take one in uh, random, they are almost surely connected. And maybe a small point to make here is that notice that the graph we were talking about earlier is not close to being too regular, it's like more close to being four regular in some sense, because we removed the direction from the edges, so I have my two edges, but also any other edges probability of like 2 over n to, to appear. Do you allow in, in your model to have uh, multiple edges? So I don't want to have, uh, to have any uh, multiplicity on the edges, but I don't so care. They, so they collapse to... If, yeah, if, if this one connect to this one and this one connect to this one, then, you're, then it's the same edge? Yeah, so if two vertices pick the same edge, let's say that it, uh, it gets uh, used only once, if you want one, like a one specific vertex to pick a, a set of edges which is of cardinality exact k or, uh, or just like randomly pick k, an edge k times, I don't think it matters. Like at least for our results, it doesn't matter. But, uh, yeah. uh, okay, so, so that's just mentioning uh, regular graphs because our graph is still not regular. I mean, it has the, the good properties that the number of edges is surely bounded by uh, kn, but it is not uh, k regular, not 2k regular. There would be some uh, I degree vertices where well, i is like logarithmic or something. But, uh, yeah, so that's about that. Don't, don't you have some, some relation to n? Like the, the fact that you only talk about k without relating it to n? So, in k over n as a parameter or something like that? That's the whole part, but uh, you don't need to. When, when n is large, you know, a fixed k is enough for this property and for other properties, as opposed to the situation where you pick edges independently or uh, this group of collector pure thing. Yeah, so, so exactly as, as Avi said, for this particular property, we don't need this connection with n, like unlike the the uh, Erdos-Schrenny model in which we did need it. But we would allow k to be a function of n. Like later, the, this would not be a problem. I don't think of k as a constant necessarily. Uh, just like I don't need it to be super constant for this uh, for this property. 
And now we finally reached the, uh, the main topic of what I, what I want to discuss, which is random subgraphs. So we know and we study for a lot of uh, decades what happens in models of random graphs, but what I care about for the purposes of using this type of things for something, for example, is what happens if I take random subgraphs of specific arbitrary graphs. And so I want to have some graph given to me without many properties on it, uh, hopefully without any known properties on it, and somehow take random subgraphs of that and still have some meaningful say about what happens. And there isn't a lot of literature about that, probably because the behavior of, the, of this type of thing is usually not, uh, not, not that great. I mean, there, there aren't very um, many useful properties. There is a decent literature about what happens when you constrain your graphs uh, to, to very specific types of, uh, of graph families. For example, if the mean degree of the graph is much larger than n over 2, then there is a, a quite long line of, uh, of work of people like uh, Ellen Fries and uh, Fennel and uh, Johnson uh, about what uh, what happens then with a few of the different models of uh, of random graphs, but for general graphs we don't know much. And when I'm saying general graphs, I'm right now speaking about the uh, the more obvious model. What is the more obvious model? This is just take your graph and uh, sample each edge with probability p. Just do the Erdős-Rényi type of thing on my specific uh, graph. So I will keep every edge with probability p and see what happens. And actually, there is something known about these things, and it's not only known, it, it was also, let's say, even extremely useful in computer science. We have the following theorem of uh, Karger, Klein, and uh, Tarjan. So it states the following if I take any graph G, and I denote by a G sub P D sample subgraph where I keep every edge with probability P, then the expected number of edges of the original graph G that connect different connected components of this sample subgraph G sub P is at most N over P. And so let's, uh, let's see a drawing. I have my graph. I uh, down sample it. I sample each edge with probability P. This even if the graph was originally connected, and I would assume that the graph was originally connected, but uh, this doesn't really matter for, uh, for the statement, uh, because uh, think about it, it was linear in N, so it's fine. Um, so this would introduce some connected components, like this subgraph would have connected components that are not necessarily at all the, the, uh, the, entire, uh, the entire graph. So in this example, I have two connected uh, components, and now I can look at the edges of the original graph, not the edges of the sample subgraph, as if they are partitioned to two types of edges. One type of, uh, type of an edge is an edge that is uh, within some component, for which both endpoints ended up being in the same connected component of my subgraph. And the second type of edges, which is what we are going to be uh, concerned with, is what we are going to call intercomponent edges. These are edges of the original graph that ended up connecting different connected components of that, uh, of that sampled subgraph. So the uh, Carter klein tarjan theorem is basically that the number of these uh, intercomponent edges in expectation is bounded by n over p. And I said that this, is, uh, this was very useful. What, what was it useful for? So first of all, this is one of the most, let's say, even say most major building blocks in the random uh, linear time uh, MST algorithm. MST is minimum spanning tree. Um, so the minimum spanning tree algorithm heavily used that, uh, that fact. Uh, and then it was later used for a, a couple of results in the PIRA model. Um, for the MST result, they actually needed a slight generalization of, of that uh, theorem because they also had weights to deal with. In the PIRAM results, they used uh, this theorem as stated, but uh, actually the generalization follows from the, the same proof, and we are going to see this uh, proof now because it's uh, 
nice and uh, not uh, not complicated. Oh, okay. This, what, what yeah. MST and Yeah, MST is minimum spanning tree. So yeah, the graph. Okay. I want the uh, spanning tree with the minimal weight. And PIRAM is not interesting today. Okay. <laughs> 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 this is some parallel model of computer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, I, mean, I don't think that uh, many people uh, work about this nowadays. Well, they do, but uh, not correctly. Right? It's uh, effective, yeah. yeah. But anyway, you don't want to go there. No. But yeah, I, see, I should say that. Can you go back? Uh, yeah, I, I don't really want to say. I just want to say that uh, for me, Calgary uh, in this case, this is uh, sort of blew everybody's mind when he started subject graphs in order to solve algorithmic problems far faster than anybody did. So first he did it for the main card problem, and uh, yeah, just again by side. Yeah, uh, and the second was when he did his MST, uh, also by himself, and then with the uh, client, uh, Italian, the improved something. But the, the idea of sampling such an unstructured object was, uh, you know, came to the algorithmic, uh, you know, landscape with a bang in this uh, David Carlin piece. <laughs> I, I, it blew my mind when I saw Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for uh, for stressing it out. Yeah, I mean, because of uh, of what we just mentioned a few slides ago about uh, random subgraphs not having many nice properties, or at least not having many uh, I mean, random subgraphs of uh, arbitrary graphs not having uh, many mathematically studied. Uh, Nice properties. This was a major thing that you can still do something with the, the properties that you do get from doing something like that. Um, yeah, and, and this this measure might might have sounded weird before, and but uh, then for the algorithmic purposes, it uh, it started making sense. And actually, for our algorithmic purpose, this this would also be the the measure that uh, that we are going to care about. Okay, so let's let's see the proof of uh, of that statement. Well, I don't know if you, you are going to do it for general p or for the proof. The proof I'm going to do it for general p. Yeah, I think it's very convenient to think about uh, p equal to the half, just uh, to realize that it's just two m edges or something, a constant. But yeah, it, yeah it's the same can... proof for any p. I'm just for thinking about the result. It's, uh, you sample half the edges of your graph and then. Only two and or constant that that would be in different components. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's sort of yeah, but uh, you saw the proof is uh, yeah, very uh, slick. Yeah, the, the proof is very slick. I think that there is another proof from afterwards, so I'm going to show the nicer one. Um, okay, so so how do we prove this uh, this statement? So actually the, the proof and this is going to be common for most proofs I'm going to show today is kind of uh, algorithmic in nature by itself. So what we are going to do is the following thing. We are going to construct our subgraph by taking an empty graph and then adding the edges of our original graph one by one, but as we want only a subgraph where each edge is sampled with probability p, we're not going to add every edge, but each time we are going over an edge, we're going to add it to our in construction sampled subgraph only with probability p. Right, and, and yeah, okay, I'll, I'll not talk about the, the weighted stuff. But, uh, the, the, right now, the order is arbitrary. For generalizations, the order just becomes not arbitrary, but by the weights of the edges. That's, that's the entire change, basically, for the, this generalization. Um, but for now, we just like arbitrarily go over the edges in some order, and whenever we reach edge, we add it to our graph with probability p. Um, OK, and now let's define a couple of, uh, of indicators. So I'm going to define by i sub e the indicator for the event that e is an intercomponent edge. It connects different connected components just before we get to it in the order. So this indicator is not about the edge ending up being an intercomponent edge, but about the edge being an intercomponent edge just when we reach it. 
Obviously, this would, uh, would upper bound the, the number of intercomponent edges in the end. I mean, if an edge was already not an intercomponent edge when we reached it, then this is not going to be an intercomponent edge by the end of, uh, of everything. Yeah, again, I'm, I didn't get the... Yeah, so I'm... I'm you're, you're saying you're, you're, you're starting adding an edge with probability P? Yeah. IE is doing the process? It, what, what? It's just just before I'm reaching the edge E, just before I'm like flipping my random coin and deciding if I'm adding this edge E to my subgraph or not, I'm checking whether or not at this time point this edge is connecting different components. And, but, and this this should be, I, I should think about it that I reach E at the end? So you can reach uh, E at, at any time throughout your uh, Consider your the first edge. The first edge, there are no edges, right? Yeah. The first edge, when you uh, consider putting it in, what do you think IE will be then? One. One, right. Yeah. But later, right, uh, let's, say, let's say you added one, two, then you added two, three, and now you are considering adding one, three, maybe because an edge in your graph. Then I would be zero. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, it's a uh, because your construction is random, it's a random variable. And this random variable is always larger than it would be if you ask the same question at the end. That's all. That's, so that's not that to be used in upper bound in the total number of interconnected edges at the end. But, but, so, so it is uh, it, it is defined using some numbering of the edges. Yeah, 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 so you, you yeah. the edges the edges number, like said, I, yeah we have like some yeah we have some fixed order of the edges. Okay. Apparently it's arbitrary and yes, this yes. is defined by that. Yeah, I okay. should have mentioned it maybe uh, more clearly. Uh, yeah, and, and as I will said, I'll just repeat it so everyone can uh, hear that. Actually, I have no idea if the people over Zoom can hear people in the classroom, but uh, well, they, it's, they, they, I think they can. can, yeah. Okay, that's, uh, that's good to know then. Um, yeah, so, so the, the important uh, thing here is that if an edge is within a connected component, it's going to stay within a connected component forever. I mean, the component can only grow, we don't remove edges. Any point. Okay, and now let's define more things, and actually I define it in a, in a bit of an annoying way on the slides as I now see, but uh, yeah, let's, let's try to forgive me for that. Denote by delta sub e the change in the number of connected components that happened during the iteration that involves the edge e. So what, what happens to the number of connected components when I'm either adding or not adding an edge. So the number of connected components can stay the same. This can happen uh, because of two reasons. Either if this edge was an uh, inside a component, or if this edge was between components but was not chosen. And it can be minus one. If this edge was connecting different connected components and it was chosen, then these two components are going to match. So the number of, uh, of components is going to be uh, reduced by uh, one. I, I probably should have uh, denoted like the minus of this delta because now I have like uh, an indicator which is a uh, negative one or zero. But uh, yeah, that's life. Uh, okay, so uh, as I as I uh, just said, let's let's take it a bit more formally. Then how does that thing behave, this delta? So if I didn't, uh, if I didn't pick the edge, if I'm not adding this edge to, to my graph, then this delta is necessarily zero. Like the probability of this delta being minus one is a complete zero. Why? Because I'm not adding anything. I'm not changing the number of connected components in any way. Uh, on the other one, the other end, if my edge was connecting different components just before deciding whether I'm adding it or not, then the probability in which I'm going to reduce the number of uh, connected components is exactly the probability in which I'm adding this edge. This happens together. If I am adding this intercomponent edge, I am reducing by one the number of connected uh, components. Otherwise, I am not. And this turns out to like this two equations and uh, 
how is it called? Like the total uh, expectation. Yeah, well, yeah, you can do it by that as well, but I don't want the the condition. I think it's like the total expectation. No, whatever. The, the, the expectation of this uh, delta or minus delta is just p times the expectation of, uh, of i sub e. Right, so the, the probability of uh, of delta happening is p if the uh, the edge is uh, intercomponent. So now we're just going to sum things up. And yeah, now we're using linearity of expectations. We're using all of our uh, undergrad uh, first uh, course, the first two uh, weeks or something uh, knowledge of this slide. So let's try to sum these things things up over all edges. And we'll just guess that p times the expected sum of these ie indicators equals the expected sum of this uh, minus uh, delta e indicators. And let's try to, to figure out what uh, these things are. So well, what is the expected sum of the ie indicators? This is the expected number of edges that are intercomponent when we reach them. So this upper bounds the number of uh, intercomponent edges in the end. On the other hand, what is this uh, expected sum of deltas or expected minus sum of deltas? This is in expectation by how much we reduced the number of connected components throughout the entire run which obviously cannot be more than n. I mean, we cannot, we can never decrease the number of connected components that started with n and cannot end by, uh, by being less than one, uh, by more than like even n minus uh, one, but let's call it n because we don't like minus things. Uh, so this is at most n. So what we get here is that p times the expected number of intercomponent edges is bounded by n. So the number of uh, the number of intercomponent edges is bounded by n over p, which is what we wanted to show. Okay, so now with that in mind, let's finally go to to the new things we are trying to introduce. So we want to still be able to get this type of property on subgraphs of arbitrary graphs, but when we keep in mind the, the disadvantages of, uh, of Erdős-Rémy graphs in terms of uh, maintaining connectivity, we are going to try to transform this, uh, this model into something more similar to that model that just picked edges going out of uh, every node. So the model we are introducing is the following. So you still have your arbitrary graph, and you have like some fixed parameter k, which will be very similar to this uh, k we just had in the general uh, model for generating random graphs. And what we're going to do is to let each node pick k incident edges. Now that there is like a small node to make about what happens if the degree of the node is less than k, then in that case, let's say that it takes everything. This doesn't... Uh, doesn't matter much. As I, said, I mean, like not, not in terms of connectivity at least. This is not going, uh, going to, to change much. Um, so like in this example, k equals two, so that thing might pick these two edges. And what we are going to do is let each node do the same thing and take the union of edges that everyone picked. So we still have some nice properties, like it's very easy to do it. I mean, it's very easy, very easy to uh, to efficiently implement this uh, this type of uh, sampling. This is not some uh, some uh, weird subset of uh, subgraphs. Um, the number of edges is very small. It's still bounded by k times n. Um, but on the other hand, we still might have some higher degree vertices because of how we do it. So let's uh, let's uh, see this uh, animation because I made it. So yeah, this this was. Some, uh, some example for a node of, uh, of degree less than k, it would just pick all of its uh, vertices, and then each node would pick its, uh, its uh, two edges, and it would take the union of everything, 
and get the exact same graph because I uh, didn't want to make two different graphs. <laughs> but yeah, it, it shouldn't be the same graph. Uh, this should be a better graph. Imagine that this graph, uh, this graph is much nicer than the than the previous graph. And I will try to to argue uh, in the time remaining that this is nicer than the previous uh, graphs. Uh, and again, we use the same definition for uh, edges that are within a component and intercomponent edges. Okay, and we ask the same question as uh, Karger, Klein, and Tarjan ask. We want to know what is the number of intercomponent edges in this model, when instead of sampling uh, each edge with uh, some fixed probability, we are sampling in this uh, K out type of model. And the theorem in the, the paper uh, of us that I'm uh, citing states that if k is larger than some, some constant times log n, then the expected number of intercomponent edges is bounded by n over k. We will soon compare it to this uh, n over p. But uh, yeah, this, can, this is always lower than the n over p, and this can be actually much lower by n over p, we'll soon do this, uh, do this uh, comparison. Um, and actually we conjecture that a constant k should suffice. We don't know how to prove it yet, but we know this is still uh, unpublished to prove some things in the middle. So we know to show it for k which is larger than uh, roughly log log n, and we can actually show that with a constant k you still get something just a bit worse. You get some like you suffer a factor of uh, in the beginning it was logarithmic, now we can maybe make it also like uh, polylogarithmic or, uh, or something like that. Can you remind me again, are you deleting k edges randomly or retaining k edges? Randomly? Yeah, so I'm keeping only k edges randomly. Um, yeah, each, each node picks uh, k incident edges out of the arbitrary graphs, uh, of the arbitrary graph, and I'm taking the union. Of all of that. It feels a little strange that the number of intercomponent edges is decreasing with the number of edges you're retaining. Right. So uh, if, I have, more edges, yeah, if, if I have more edges, the connected components would be bigger. They would like uh, ah. consume more of, uh, more of the dot. Yeah. So okay. oh. that is kind of proportional to P. So if you if you were in a, in a fixed degree graph, in a, in a irregular graph, then K was yeah. Okay. Yeah. So k, k over d would uh, kind of be p. Yeah. Right. Like what, what Leo mentioned is, uh, I mean, we will do this calculation in a, in a, a couple of slides. This is like a, there's a, there's a common saying within lecturers that uh, the difference between a good and an excellent question is whether or not the answer is in the next slide. So, yeah, this is uh, this is going to uh, to be seen uh, quite soon. Uh, and as I said, hopefully this uh, assumption about k larger than log n is uh, completely unnecessary. I mean, we know that this is not necessary as stated, but hopefully it's not necessary at all. Again, we think that 2 or something like that should be the, the correct uh, threshold for that. Um, okay, so this is the statement we would want to show. And actually, I would spend uh, a few minutes before the before going to, to the break with just uh, giving you a matching lower bound for that because it is simple enough to to show in a few minutes. I want to claim that in this model, this is actually the best you can expect getting. And we would later uh, see another uh, short example showing that also in the Kargel Klein Tarjan model, uh, what they get, what uh, Kargel gets, uh, is uh, is the best you can with that model, so that n over p was necessary for some graph, so there is a, a difference here. So how do we show that this is all? Yeah. Is there an interest to, to characterize graphs using uh, these properties? So saying for which graphs you do have such, such, a, such a nice threshold and for which you don't? Uh, so or the, in a way, how much is this well, you pick a graph and then how much is your model different from the Herbert-Schrenner model, which is the complete graph? So we will say something about that. One thing that uh, that we can already say about that, and this would also be written in some slides, so again, okay. an excellent question, uh, is that if my degree is, if not my degree, if k is larger than log n, 
larger than some constant times log n, uh, and the graph is roughly regular, and all degrees are within, let's say, the same uh, a constant strip from each other, then the two models are roughly the same. Right, because if the degree is larger than log n, then in expectation the number of edges I'm going to get is roughly that thing. I can bound it by uh, take uh, take k, which is like yeah. twice that or something like that. Um, and if the, the degree is a kind of a regular, then the probability in which I'm sampling edges is roughly the same for every edge. So it is true that for graphs that are close to being regular. Uh, our theorem also holds for the previous model. Okay? For graphs that are not close to being regular, it's not the, the same. So this might be a partial answer to that. Okay, so wh why is n over k the best you can hope for? We can look at the following example. Take two clicks of size n over 2. Here n over 2 is 5 because this is the largest click I can draw on PowerPoint. Uh, so you take these two clicks of size n over 2 and add a matching of size n over k between them. And so this is just a matching. It connects uh, n over k distinct nodes in that part to n over k distinct nodes in that part. And now let's ask ourselves what is the probability of each edge in that matching being picked. So the probability of a specific edge in the matching being picked is at most, but actually very, very close to, being something like twice k over n over 2. Why is that? Because the probability that a specific endpoint picks this edge as one of its uh, k random uh, edges is roughly k over n over 2, because its degree is n over 2 and it picks k edges. And there are two endpoints to the edge. Each of them can pick this edge. So this is roughly that, and definitely upper bounded by that. And the next thing to notice is that the probability in which edges of this matching are being picked is independent. I mean, these events are independent. Why is that? Because this edge can be picked only by these two vertices, and this edge on the other end can be picked only by these two vertices. This is a matching, and so in both sides, this set of uh, n over k uh, vertices is uh, distinct, so uh, the probabilities with which these edges are picked are completely uh, independent, these are independent events, which means that the probability that nothing is picked in this n over k matching is at least that, at least 1 minus the probability that an edge is being picked, this is 4k over n, as we said, to the power of how many edges we had. So this is like 1 minus some constant times k over n to n over k. So this is a constant. We have a constant probability with which the entire matching is not picked. This means that the expected number of intercomponent edges is at least this constant times n over k. Right? Because with constant probability, all of these edges would be intercomponent edges because I didn't pick anything from, uh, from this cut. So that's, yeah, that's, that's the lower bound. That means that the, for this graph, the expected number of intercomponent edges is at least n over k, for every k. So this is like uh, tied for, uh, for any k uh, you pick, unless you, you force some, uh, some more graph properties. And I don't know, like, how, how do you feel regarding a break? Should we do it now or in five minutes after just the comparison to the... Do whatever is convenient for you. I don't think that everybody cares about five minutes. So what's more natural? Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's do five more minutes and then we'll go to a break. Maybe I shouldn't have said it. Maybe now, uh, now it makes people let up. And not listen and, listen and wait for the, the break. Uh, or maybe this happens only with under um, okay, so let's, let's compare the two things. So what uh, Karger, Klein, and uh, Tarjan uh, had is this n over p. What we have here is this n over k. Let's try to compare them when we are trying to pick the same number of edges. Right, so if I want to get nk edges, which is what we get with our k out model in the kkt model, then p has to be something like nk over m. 
because the number of edges I'm going to have there is p times n. Each edge is a peak to a probability p. So to have the same number of edges in expectation, at least I need something like that. And if this is the p I'm using, then n over p turns out to be m over k. So for sparse graphs, this is roughly the same thing, but the, the graphs are obviously not necessarily sparse at all. So there can be a huge difference if the graph is even somewhat dead. Okay, so let's let's see an example showing that this is that. So if I want to show... What was M in the first... Oh, right. M is the number of edges in the, in the graph. Right, because if, uh, if I'm picking every existing edge of probability P, then I expect to have PM edges in my subgraph. I have M original edges, each one is picked with probability P. So, yeah, if, if I want the, the two uh, expectations to be equal or roughly equal, I need this type of P, which would give me this type of edges, this type of number of, uh, of edges. And let's see that this thing is tight, that we can really have this, uh, this factor of n between the, the two models. So let's say that my graph is the following thing. I take one click of size n over 2, and then I add something linear in k, uh, amount of clicks of size n over something linear in k. In particular, I would take 8k copies of uh, n over 16k click. This, uh, this should sum up to n. The, uh, the number of vertices I have in my graph, so this is just a bunch of disjoint clicks. How many edges do I have? So I have at least n squared over 8 edges. Why is that? Because of the big click. I, the, the, the big click has uh, n over 2 uh, edges, then the has n over 2 vertices, so it has at least this amount of, uh, of edges. And uh, one note to make is that uh, my graph is uh, disconnected, but if I would just like connect it with, uh, with something sparse, like nothing would happen. Um, okay, and because the number of edges in my graph is now roughly n squared, this graph is very dense, then as we said before, in order to have the same number of edges as we would with a k out sampling, I need p to be roughly n k over m. In this case, this is at most 8k over n. Right? I, I need to, to do that because otherwise I would sample uh, too many edges. So I can't allow myself out of uh, n squared edges to sample an edge of probability that is more than roughly k over n. And now let's see what happens in their, uh, in their model to the number of intercomponent edges. So in our model, we know that it should be n over k because this is, uh, this is the digital state. So, what, what happens there? Let's see the probability that a vertex in one of the smaller clicks doesn't, doesn't uh, sample any edge. Right? So this thing happens with a constant probability. Why, why is that? Because the probability with which an edge is sampled is 8k over n, and the size of each of the small clicks is n over 16k. Right, so the probability of a vertex to not have any edge adjacent to its sample is a constant. Right? Probability roughly k over n and roughly n over k uh, possible edges. Okay, so a vertex in a small click doesn't sample any edge with constant probability. Um, maybe this is a bit confusing because the node doesn't, like the vertex doesn't sample anything. What I mean by that is that no edge adjacent to the vertex is being sampled. Uh, okay, and in case that this event happened, that nothing was sampled that touches this node, then all of these edges are going to be intercomponent. They are going to connect different connected components. So for each node, I have a constant probability that all of its adjacent edges are intercomponent. So let's just count. So each edge can be counted at most twice because it has two endpoints. And we have roughly or exactly n over two vertices that appear in the small clicks. And each of them with a constant probability would add n over 16k or n over 16k minus one, which is the size of the small click intercomponent edges divided by, by this two that takes into account that we have two sides for, uh, for every edge. 
So this is a lower bound for the number of intercomponent edges, and this is just roughly n over 2 times roughly n over k, which is n squared over k. So in the Carrier et al. model, you may get something like n squared over uh, k edges if your graph is dense and you are trying to still remain with only k n vertices. Correct. Uh, yeah, k n edges. Thanks. Okay, so this would be a good time for uh, and a term. you want to, the punchline is in your model, it would only be n over k. Yeah, in our model <laughs> it's, uh, it's n over k. Yeah, I thought we stated that before. Not stated. Well, it doesn't matter, but you will you show you want to contrast uh, n yeah. squared over k with n over k, but you did change that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, well, we get n over k instead of this m over k, which can really be m over k. Like, even if the graph is dense, it can be n squared over k. Uh, as we said before, there are some occasions like almost regular graphs in which you would not be able to construct such examples, but uh, for general graphs you can. We are now going to take a 10 minutes break. Let's and take five and then people can read Okay, so let's take a five minutes break. I, you didn't hear me before then. And afterwards we would both show an application and show some parts of the, the, the proof. We'll see some uh, simplified questions. Uh, thanks. Oh, thanks for the starting the recording. I see that they uh, were being watched at least uh, this way somewhere. Okay, so let's get uh, back into it. So hopefully we would uh, finish what we wanted to say. So. One thing I would mention before getting into the proof and before getting um, into the application is that in that regime, the regime that we are talking about right now, even though this was improved afterwards, of k which is much larger than log n, and then actually, actually it was a bit misleading in the beginning. Because in that regime it's not really, it, it doesn't really matter. If, uh, if you would take uh, k edges out of every node or would pick each edge with some probability. Because when you are much larger than log n, then this probability of having nothing, it doesn't really exist. This is not something that bothers you. The main difference in that regime is that the probability in which we are taking edges every depends on the degrees of its endpoints. So, so this is kind of what gives us more power because lower degree vertices that are more difficult to connect to other things as we've seen, for example, in the, in the last example with the smaller clicks, have an higher probability of being picked. But on the other end, still the number of expected edges in total or the fixed number of edges in total, if I am doing it as I defined it, is still small, it's still at most k, k times n because I took this higher probability only for low degree vertices. I mean, there is some difference, because for vertices that are not of, a, of degree, which is at least a, this a log n or something, there would be a difference. But if all of my degrees were, uh, were high and k is high, then the things are, uh, are similar. And, and as I mentioned before, this means, for example, that for regular or roughly regular graphs, by the time that the degrees uh, differ just by, uh, by a constant uh, factor, then the two models are roughly the same. This means that our result also holds for roughly regular graphs in, uh, in, in the regular model, in which you just pick each edge with the same probability. Okay, so before going into the proof or a simplified uh, version of the proof, what we are first going to show is an application for that. And what 
I would like to argue, uh, even though I mean, this is one example, since then there is another uh, one like other example that this is even a weaker version of what we do, but uh, is one other example. I would like to hope that there would be more uh, example of this type of uh, of use, but uh, someone still needs to find it. Maybe maybe it's us, uh, maybe it's not. Um, but what I want to argue is that our sampling model fits very well with the world of uh, distributed algorithms, in in which uh, we typically think of each vertex of our graph as some uh, separate uh, computing unit. There are many different models. There are many different things that are happening in in these uh, different models, but kind of the, the common ground is that usually vertices uh, do stuff locally at, at some point. And in some sense our model is, uh, is very, very nicely working with that. Because in our model each node picks this uh, fixed, uh, fixed number of, uh, of neighbors and does whatever we should do with them. So we want to, to argue that, uh, that this should help distributed algorithms. And I'm going to show you one um, rather than standard uh, distributed model and one problem within it that we can, uh, that we can uh, solve much better than was done before and using uh, that result. Um, okay, so, so I will start by stating the problem and I would uh, give a bit of uh, motivation and background because this was uh, extensively studied before, but uh, for uh, other reasons. Okay, so let's say that I have some undirected graph, and now I'm doing the following weird thing. There are some public, globally known names for all of the vertices. So everyone knows their name and the name of their neighbors. And now each node, who can only see itself and its neighbors, so it sees itself and it sees its list of, uh, of adjacent edges, it sees which neighbors are uh, its neighbors and their names. And each node seeing that needs to produce some message. What, what is this message then? All of these messages are going to be sent in a, in a one way, one round type of thing to some global referee that doesn't know anything about the graph. It knows that uh, this is the list of possible names for nodes, but it doesn't know anything else about this, uh, this graph. This referee would have to read all messages and to decide whether or not the graph is connected or even to find a spanning uh, tree or a spanning forest if the graph is not connected of, uh, of the graph. And the question is how short can these messages be? Then the obvious uh, thing to do would to just like send your entire uh, adjacency list, send your uh, entire adjacency vector uh, even. And uh, as the graph is undirected, you can even do it with n over two bits, right? Because I cannot, I can send not the entire adjacency vector, but only the n over two uh, bits of the adjacency vector, starting with my index. This would be good enough because uh, for each edge, one of the uh, endpoints would cover the the next one in the next half of the. Uh, like, I don't care about constants. Yeah, true. I don't care about constants, but uh, these people do care about constants. But your example probably improve what they do by more than constants. Yeah, that's the I'm just, uh, I'm just saying that there is like, well, I, I, I wanted to say that there is something that is not the most trivial thing uh, you can do before, but this was uh, basically all that was known in uh, in this model, unless you allow shared randomness. So if you allow all of the vertices to not be able only to draw random bits, but also that this, uh, this random bits would be uh, known to everyone, which is a bit weird in this model because we are trying to, to have no communication, this is some type of communication, then you can do much better. In these uh, this settings you can actually get, uh, get messages of size that is roughly log uh, n cubed. And the interesting thing is that there is also a matching lower bound. So this is 
a tight thing. So with shared randomness, the best you can do here is exactly log a uh, log a cube of n. Every every vertex sends. Log yeah, every vertex sends uh, log a cube of n. The lower bound is uh, of Huacheng uh, U and uh, Gerani Nelson. Um, okay, and the reason that this problem is interesting is well, it, it is. Uh, a nice problem in some sense, but also it's uh, very tightly related to uh, streaming. So you can uh, you can rephrase this thing in the in the context of uh, streaming algorithms for uh, those who know what it is. And if not, uh, it doesn't matter. This is a nicer, uh, more clean uh, setting, I think. And this uh, n over two simple algorithm I mentioned was the best known thing without shared randomness. So if you don't allow uh, the vertices to have some uh, shared uh, pool of uh, random uh, bits that they are all aware of, the best you could do is n over 2. And we are going to use our results to improve this to root n log n. Um, we do use randomness here, though uh, our randomness on the other end is uh, only private. So we do need vertices to be able to, to draw bits, but now this is not shared between uh, anyone. Like, they don't share information, they just, like, do something randomly, and we would want that the referee would be able to determine if the graph is connected or not, or to get a, a spanning forest with a high probability. But now there is no... Um, nothing is shared among the, the vertices. So you can argue that still this is not deterministic, but now it's at least we don't share things between between like entities that should not communicate because this model. What was the lower bound again? Good. So log n to the log n to the power of three. Like the power of three is on the log. So the square the square the square of the versus the log to the to the log square. So the the log cubed was the was not only a lower bound, but this is actually tight in the shared randomness case. Uh, in this uh, private randomness case, and even in the deterministic case, we don't know of uh, any better lower bounds. We tried to think of that, actually. And this is an interesting question. Like, uh, I mean, it's, it's worth thinking about. At least in the deterministic, uh, deterministic uh, setting, it seems that uh, many of us, uh, including the guys who worked on the uh, on, on this like log uh, cube lower bounds, we, we think that uh, actually in the deterministic setting you need something linear, um, but even that we cannot, we cannot show anything better than this uh, polylog thing. Okay, so let, let's see how, uh, how we get that. And the first thing we are going to use is something that was also used in the public randomness algorithm and in a few other places. I'm going to state it a bit more generally because I would uh, want to transform it to something we can use later. Um, but let's say that uh, every edge has some name that everyone knows. It. So in the previous versions, the name was just uh, the obvious name of the edge, just like take its uh, two endpoints, everyone uh, agree on the names of the endpoints, then just like uh, concatenate them to each other. I don't know, do it in like sorted order or something, so, uh, so this would be determined uniquely, but Let's let's be able to generalize that. Let's say that every edge has this uh, type of uh, public name that everyone knows. And now what we are going to do is that each vertex is going to send the following message. Each vertex is going to send the XOR of the names of all of its uh, incident edges. XOR, you mean it's I mean a bit sequence. Yeah, so I'm okay. thinking, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, make this more clear. I'm taking the names of all of the edges uh, that are adjacent to me. I think of them as strings of bits. Yeah, I think of them as like entities, entities in uh, like a z to to the something. Yeah, and I'm pointwise uh, XORing. I'm pointwise uh, summing in, uh, in z to what uh, what I have in the names of uh, of all edges. Why do I do that? Like, what is the uh, what is the nice property of this thing? Except of, uh, I mean, this is obviously linear. This is uh, nice, but except of being linear, the property of 
פוינט וואי זה אקסטורינג, או פוינט וואי זה דישן עם זה דו דו סמפינג, היא שאת everything is the negation of itself. If I'm summing something up twice, it's going to, to become zero. How am I going to use that? So let's say we have any subset of vertices. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You have some kind of a bound on the, on the number of bits uh, for each LE. So this is... Like something that depends on V. Well, so with the very obvious edge names, this is going to be like 2 log n. or something like that, right? because I have n vertices and is, this is just a, a pair of uh, vertices. Uh, afterwards, I would want to have more elaborate uh, names that could be uh, longer, but it is important to stress out that the size of the mes messages is the same as the size of the uh, edge names, right? Because this is not yeah. an, uh, an addition like in, uh, in Z, this is uh, just uh, this uh, pointwise uh, thing, then the size is not increasing. Of, uh, because of No, I just tried to say, the square root and log n that you showed before. This would be the total length of, I didn't prove it yet, but it's just for a single vertex? Yeah, this would be the size of the message that a single vertex sets. Okay, thanks. That's what I mean. Okay, so now if I do have these messages, this point-wise z2 addition of the names of the edges, Then what I'm going to, to ask is what happens if I take any subset of vertices and sum up in the same fashion their messages. Right, so I have this subset uh, S of uh, V and I want to uh, pointwise uh, XOR the messages that they send. I want to pointwise XOR the pointwise XORs of the incident edges of all of them. What is this thing going to be? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so what? So let's say that I have my uh, I have my subset of uh, vertices. Then what each vertex adds to this sum is the sum of all of its incident edges. And then what happens when I do it for all vertices in this subset? Then every edge that is within the uh, yeah, every edge that is within this subset, a edge that is within this, uh, within, between two different vertices that are both in S, is going to get cancelled because I'm summing it up twice, right, in both of its endpoints and the XO of something with itself is, uh, is zero. On the other hand, every edge that is in the cut defined by S is going to be summed up only once. So I'm going to actually, in my sum, have only edges that cross the cut. So if I'm XORing the messages of all vertices in some subset of vertices S, then what I'm getting is the XOR of the names of all edges in the cut defined by S. The XOR of the names of all edges that cross between S and the uh, complement of S in my graph. And that, that thing was, uh, was basically the... Uh, the only thing needed to get the, I mean, that, that and, and some uh, clever uh, sampling arguments, but this, this was the heart of the uh, public, uh, public randomness algorithm. I mean, in a few words, you can think about it as, I would use the public randomness to have many down samples of my graph. I would have like many samples with like different, uh, different uh, probabilities. Yeah, I have like a sample and then a sample of that sample and then a sample of that sample and so on and I do it a, a few times and then I would be able to expect that in one of these samples there would be only one edge crossing a specific cut and then I would be able to use that to determine which edge is that. So I'm not getting into, into details but this is, the, this is the primitive use in order to, to, get that, uh, to get that result. Because as you can see if there is only one edge crossing my cut then I would just be able to read the name of this edge out of, uh, out of uh, that property. 
Um, okay, but if we don't want to do this uh, sampling, because we can't have any type of uh, shared sampling, because the nodes cannot share the, the random bits, what they use to sample, what is the sample they are, uh, they are looking at with, uh, with each other, then how, how could we hope to use it? Um, then maybe, maybe the most naive hope we could have is an hope that we would be able to choose some more elaborate uh, edge names such that these summations for any possible subset of, of edges would be distinct. I mean, if we had something like that, then we could determine uh, the connectivity of the graph or build the spanning forest as we would just like take a cut, uh, XOR all of its messages, see uh, a distinct uh, addition, so we could just be able to uh, decipher what was the, uh, the set of edges in this cut and go on like that. What is the problem with that? It requires so many bits. Yeah, how many bits would something like that require? So if we want this to be distinct for every possible subset of the edges, then just by pigeon hole principle, I would need the, the size of this thing to be more than, uh, than how many subsets of uh, edges I can have. Right? So the names of the edges would have to, have to be as long as the number of uh, edges, which is uh, too much, way too much. But what I could hope to get is the same thing, but not for all subsets, but only for small subsets. Right, so, so I can uh, get uh, edge names such that summations would be distinct as long as the, the set of edges is of size at most t, let's say. What can I do with that? I mean, what is the minimal uh, number of bits such that there is some function from, uh, let's denote by uh, uppercase n, the, like the names of all edges, like the, the amount of uh, possible edges in my graph, so what is the minimal number of bits such that I can get names for edges that are of size uh, b uh, bits such that any subset of at most t edges has a unique, uh, unique uh, summation, unique uh, polarized XOR. Now, still the same lower bound as before holds. I mean, I still cannot, uh, because of uh, pigeon hole principle, cannot uh, hope for more than log of the number. Of, uh, of such subsets. Uh, but actually, if I just take a random construction, this is uh, up to a constant factor what I can get. Right? If, I, uh, if I just randomly pick the names of, uh, of edges, then what is the expected number of uh, T sums that, uh, that uh, intersect? This is roughly the number of, uh, of this subset, uh, subsets uh, squared times the probability that two specific subsets would have the same uh, would have the same sum. You can notice that the sum of uh, if, if I have this equation of the sum of some subset equals the sum of another subset, then because this is only a point where is XOR, then this is the same as the XOR of both subsets together is uh, zero. And because the subsets are uh, distinct, and there is something, there is some edge name in this uh, subset I'm XORing, so this thing would also be uniformly random. Because if I uh, take anything and XOR a random bit to it, what I get is a random bit. It doesn't matter even what, uh, what the rest of the, the, things, the things are. I take XORing a random bit to whatever distribution gives you uniformly random uh, bit. Okay. So a random construction would give me basically twice that, uh, that lower bound. So this means that the length uh, of messages I need is uh, roughly log of that thing. And if t is not very large, this is roughly t log n. Yeah. And log uh, of uppercase n would be the same as log of uh, lowercase n, because uppercase n is just uh, n squared. So in the end, t would be root n. In the very near end, actually. Uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be like a few more uh, rows. Um, no, nobody argued here that there is a problem with uh, this being a random construction, but there isn't. Like, 
there, there isn't a problem because of two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that I didn't say anything about computation time. I mean, I didn't uh, limit the computation time neither of the referee or of the vertices. So they can even just, I don't know, list all possible functions uh, from, uh, from edges to uh, names and take the first one uh, in lexicographic order for which everything is distinct and this is a way to agree on a function that doesn't require any randomization. Right, so we can just think of that as an existent proof. There is some function um, to uh, bit strings of that length such that every sum of uh, t things is distinct. They can do that. But actually this can um, relatively easily be, be made uh, explicit and even efficient using uh, just like linear error correcting points. Okay, so this is this was not a mention, but this is not a problem. Um, okay, and now we're ready to, to just like state our algorithm. So all we're going to do is to do that thing that we just mentioned, but on top of that, send k random uh, incident edges. All right, so each node is going to send k random uh, neighbors, and on top of the k random neighbors, it's going to send this message we just uh, talked about, the XOR of the edge names of all edges coming out of it, not only of this, uh, this subset of uh, k neighbor, neighbors, but of everyone. And what should t be? Then t should roughly be n over k. Why should t roughly be uh, n over k? Because what the referee is going to do with the messages, it's going to be as follows. First, the referee would take all the edges that were just sent to him, right? Every node, uh, every vertex sent uh, k edges, sent uh, k uh, random neighbors, this is uh, k edges. Then the referee would just like see these edges, it would be able to put these edges in the graph it is building and see some connected components according to that. And then in order to, to find out about intercomponent edges, about edges going between these components, it is going to use this uh, XOR trick. It is going to take all the messages in every connected component, XOR them, and see what process they have. And because of our theorem, we know that the number of intercomponent edges is at most n over k, which means that the subset of edges that is XOR in, uh, in, in the XOR of messages of each of these uh, connected components is at most O of n over k. Right? So, it would be enough to send k random labels and this type of labels for t which is roughly n over k. And how much is this going to cost me? The size of the messages, uh, constant, uh, constants are ignored for now, is k times log n, these are my k random labels, plus this message. And we said that the size of this message is roughly t log n. Right, and uh, t is n over k, and uppercase n is roughly lowercase n when I uh, take the logarithm of it, um, which means that I should pick k as a square root n, and then I'm done. And I get messages that are roughly of, uh, of length root n times, uh, times log n, and this is uh, exactly what I wanted to have. And as you can see, actually, the k we're using it for is very large, so the log n, um, condition where in our theorem doesn't hurt the application at all. It could be, uh, even hopefully, there are uh, more applications that would use a very small k, but for this thing uh, we didn't need it. So where did you use the k random neighbors? In order to okay, so what the referee did was take the random neighbors, this is basically, he gets this, uh, this sample sum graphs. Because each node sent k edges, he sees this sample subgraph. And after having this sample subgraph, he could divide the graph to connected components such that the number of edges crossing each connected component is at most n over k. This is the, uh, the use of our result. And this is why it was enough to have labels for at most n over k edges. Right, so the, the labels could be for very, I mean, this is another contrast from, uh, from the Karger uh, tangent thing. Notice that we, we not only get a linear number of edges in this graph, but actually something that is uh, sublinear by a lot. We can get, uh, get a very small amount of edges crossing uh, components, and this, and this is why we managed to, to gain something. Okay, 
So in the rest of the time, I'm going to, to give you a proof of a simplified version of this theorem. Uh, by simplified, I mean that uh, obviously I would stay in the k larger the Logan regime. I would not get into uh, the, the improvement of that. But also I would be willing to suffer uh, another, uh, another term of log n in the number of edges. Right, so I would not be able to get to n over k edges, I would be able to get to n over k times log n edges. And this, I mean, this, this is still far from the, the proof uh, with, uh, without the log n. The, a lot of the work is in uh, fighting with that log n. But the, it does uh, sketch some kind of, an, um, let's call it, high level overview of the, the way the proof looks like. As I said before, when we talked about uh, Cargill's proof, this proof is also going to be some, somewhat algorithmic in, uh, in nature, even though the, the result itself is not uh, algorithmic. Okay, so the way we are going to do it is we are going to, to take our graph and also think about this, uh, this sampling as some type of a process, as we did in the Cargill uh, and the way this process is going to work is that we, at every time point, would already have some edges that we decided to sample already. And we are going to decide from where we are going to sample more edges. And the way we are going to decide where we want to sample more edges from is by looking at the current connected components and taking the smallest one. Why is that? that? That would be helpful because it will try to always double the size of a, of a component. We want that every time this type of uh, sampling out of a component succeeds, then the size of the component doubles. This would be helpful and this would be the reason for this log n in, uh, in this example. Okay, so let's, uh, let's see another animation. So in the beginning, no edge is sampled so far. So everything is a component of size one. So I would just pick uh, any arbitrary vertex and would sample things out of it. Let's say that I sample this edge. And it would take a while until I would do something else, because as long as it, there is some isolated vertex, then I would just sample things out of it. But after some time, there would be larger connected uh, components, and then I would try to sample things out of a larger component, for example, out of these uh, two vertices as this is now one of the smallest uh, connected components. And the next important thing is that this sampling step, this taking a component and trying to sample things going out of it, would not always work. I mean, sometimes we would not get an edge crossing this com component. Maybe it got uh, only two, two vertices inside the component, maybe there were not enough edges on this part, so it would not always succeed. And what we are going to do when we are trying to grow a component, this is the terminology I'm going to use now, and we fail, when we don't manage to connect our components to anything else, then what we are going to do is to remove from our graph all edges in that cut. Why do I mean, what do I mean by that? I mean that if I took a component and didn't manage to go, it didn't manage to connect it to anything else, then I'm removing from my graph all edges that, uh, that cost uh, this cut, and all of these edges are not going to participate in any future step in our uh, process, and that means that all of these edges could potentially be intercomponent edges in the end. So another similarity, uh, in hindsight at least, to, to Cargill's proof is that I'm not really going to count the number of intercomponent edges in the end, but I'm going to count the number of intercomponent edges where for each edge I, I consider it in a different time. But this is still fine because if an edge is not intercomponent at, uh, at some time, that it would never be, uh, become intercomponent in uh, any, any time after that. So what you say you try, you try by adding one edge or you try by adding? Yeah, so I still didn't say anything about our time, but what I said so far is that if, for example, this is my, uh, my smallest connected component, then I would try to sample edges from this cut somehow. Soon we would say uh, how, but this would either be by, uh, I don't know, like sampling each of these edges with some probability. You don't sample edges, you sample vertex sample yeah. these neighbors. That's yeah, right. that would basically be each, each, neighbor, each vertex in this uh, smallest component would sample edges uh, going out of it. Uh, somehow, 
Um, and no notice that as we are in the K larger than low real regime, then I can think of that as I sample each edge in here with a probability that, uh, that depends on the degree of the, yeah. of the vertex in that component. But, uh, but yeah, this, this vertex has sample edges, but they, they don't have to, to manage to sample anything going out of the component. It could be that they sample only edges that go within the component, and in that case, I'll just remove all of the edges that, uh, that go out of, uh, out of that component, and, and in that case, I'll just count them as possibly intercomponent. So again, why, why in this case you cannot um, grow the, the component? So as, as I said to Avi, I didn't say it exactly how I'm sampling uh, edges out of uh, out of nodes, but I'm trying uh, something. I'm just trying to, to to understand why the, the edges that you just deleted. It are, it could be that, it could be that uh, this is uh, this is a k out model with k equals two, even though it couldn't because k is two k is two that doesn't matter, and this vertex uh, well this component is maybe too small. But what, I, what could happen is that all of the edges that I sample are within the component. That I tried to sample the edges out of the node and all of them fell within the component. That was maybe quite big already, maybe the cut was very small. Uh, and then I didn't manage to, uh, like, with the k samples I want to do, I didn't manage to get anything that causes the component, uh, that causes the cut. Nothing went out of it. Uh, is this deterministic or uh, random? It is random. Like the, okay. yeah. So I'm just like, I'm but trying to... It's possible that there are good yeah. edges. And yeah, definitely, because we are going to, we are exactly going to count that, like how many edges are there in this cuts that we remove. How many edges are removed, these are edges that are possibly becoming an intercomponent. Okay, so all of these edges are removed and are counted as a, as a possible loss. So we want to say that the number of removed edges is at most n over k times log n. This uh, simplified proof. Okay, and as I said, because we are in the regime where we can allow ourselves to uh, sample edges with some probability, and not only sample a fixed number of uh, of neighbors for each node, then what we are going to do is to say that in each of these steps we will sample each edge on the cut with uh, some probability, but we will make sure that for each specific vertex. If I would look throughout the entire process on the probabilities with which I tried to sample edges that are adjacent to it, this would always sum up to something that is less than k over its degree. So I don't want any, any node to sample uh, in expectation more than, uh, than k edges. That, that means that I would have different sample probabilities along the process, but they would not sum to more than k over its degree because otherwise that, uh, that would be uh, too much. And in our regime, this is uh, the same as uh, maybe not something uh, exactly k uh, neighbors, but it's, uh, it's subsumed by doing something like sampling uh, two k edges, or k plus uh, root k or whatever. Uh, okay, so now it's not that the degrees are exactly k, but the expected with a very strong concentration uh, is around k. And now we are going to, uh, to discuss about the, the actual way in which we are sampling edges out of these uh, components. So we're going to distinguish between two types of components. Components we will call high degree components and the others will be low degree components because of that. So what is a high degree component? A component is called high degree is Okay, first of all, I'm, I'm only talking about these components I'm trying to go, the components who are the smallest in, uh, in this uh, iteration, in this uh, part of the process. So, a component is called an high degree component if the size of it is s and there is some vertex inside the component of degree at least 2s. So, if there is some vertex inside the component with degree that is at least twice the size of the component, then I call this an high degree component. Why? Because now if I look at this vertex, I can see that this vertex itself has at least half of its neighbors out of the component. So now I'm actually not going to try to sample out of anything else except of this vertex. Why? Because this vertex, if I just like sample a random neighbor of it, I have a very good chance of, uh, of getting out of, my, uh, out of my component. And I'm also not going to, to give up. I'm just like 
sample neighbors out of this uh, out of this uh, vertex until I connect to something because I have a probability of uh, of half in every and every try to to connect to something else and then we can ask ourselves how many neighbors I'm going to sample in this fashion throughout the entire process so you can notice that the same component can be in a in a, in a growing step we can try to grow a, com a component at most log n times because when we try to grow a component we either succeed and the size of the component doubles which cannot happen more than log n times because otherwise the component would be larger than the entire graph or fail and then we would never try to, uh, to sample out of this component again because we removed everything that goes out of it so this is not interesting anymore this is getting uh, removed from our graph so I'm going to try to do this thing at most uh, log n times and then each time I expect only two tries basically as like uh, the, the following basic probability question I'm uh, flipping an uh, unbiased coin and I wonder uh, after how, much, how many uh, flips I'm going to have uh, log n uh, ads for example yeah, so this is an expectation log n and also it is very concentrated around that so this is going to cost me only log n neighbors per uh, vertex up to a constant. Okay, so this didn't cost much, which means that what I am going to, to pay for is components that are of low degrees. This is the interesting case, where all of the, where all of the degrees are at most 2s, where s is the size of the component. This is what I would call a low degree component. What I am going to do in this scenario, actually not in the final analysis of the proof, but in the simplified analysis, in the uh, complete analysis, this is a bit more complicated. But what is going to suffice to get the simplified result is to just sample each edge that touches the component, each edge that crosses the cut and was not yet removed, with probability k over s, where s is the size of the component. First of all, why is that fine? Why, why do the probabilities sum up to what I want them to? Then the first thing to notice is that a vertex would start having its edges uh, sampled in that fashion only when its component would become larger than its, uh, its degree, or half its uh, degree or something like that. Which means that the first time that a component samples uh, a component that contains a specific vertex V samples its uh, outgoing edges in, uh, in such a fashion is when S is at least D over 2 where D is the degree of that vertex so the first sample is going to be with probability that is at most uh, 2k over D and every time you are doing this uh, again the size of the component at least double right? it could be that it, uh, it got uh, larger than that, it could be that we uh, we start doing that sometime in the middle because the edges were removed, because all of the edges are now inside or anything else, but we would not sample an edge adjacent uh, to a vertex because of growing steps that involve a component containing this vertex more than with probabilities that are roughly 2k over d, then 2k over 2d, then 2k over 4d and so on which means that the total probability with which we sample edges uh, adjacent to a sum node sums up to some constant times k over d where d is the degree and this is what we wanted right? this means that the expected number of, uh, of outgoing edges is roughly k which in our regime is also like with high probability less than uh, 2k or oh, even less than that okay so that, that's good for us. The question is why, why does that work? Why do we not have uh, too many removed edges, which in turn could be intercomponent edges? So as we said, if we fail with this type of sample, we just remove all of the edges and all of them could potentially become intercomponent. So let's denote the number of the edges in the count like that. What is like that? So I'm going to denote the number of outgoing edges for my smallest component by x times s over k where k is our uh, fixed uh, k out parameter and s is the size of the component so x is in some sense the, the density of the cut or, uh, or something uh, 
something like that. And now we are going to ask ourselves what is the number of edges we remove if we fail and what is the probability that we fail. So the expected number of removed edges is the number of edges. This is x times s over k. And of course times the probability that we didn't manage to sample anything crossing the cut. What is the probability that we don't sample anything crossing the cut? This is 1 minus the probability to sample, to sample something, which was k over s, uh, to the power of the number of edges, which is uh, x times s over k. And that thing up to the x is just uh, e to the minus 1, up to the minus, well, something like that. This is the expected number of uh, removed edges. And then you can notice that that x e to the minus x is upper bounded by, let's say, uh, 1 or something like that. This, uh, this increases much uh, faster than this increases. And for every uh, non-negative x, this is bounded by uh, some cost. Let's call it. So this means that the expected number of removed edges is s over k. And now we can just amortize that cost uh, on the vertices in our uh, component. That means, let's say that in a growing step, each vertex pays in expectation for 1 over k edges. Right? Because in expectation, I am removing s over k edges, but s vertices participated in this growing step. S vertices uh, belong to that uh, component that I'm trying to grow. So I can say that each vertex pays in expectation for 1 over k edges in a growing step. And in turn, every vertex, as we said a few times already, participates in only at most slow and successful growing steps. When it, uh, it belongs to an unsuccessful growing step, this step it could start becoming part of uh, growing steps at all. Uh, which means that the amortized the expected number of removed edges that I uh, give for every vertex throughout the entire process is at most log n over k. Right, so I kind of split the expected number of removed edges I'm going to, to have among the, the vertices such that every vertex paid in expectation only log n over k, which means that in total we expect not more than the time, uh, this thing times the number of vertices, like n over k times log n. Uh, and that's pretty much the simplified proof, except the fact that I lied to you at some point. Where did I lie to you? I will try to point you towards it, there was a very important thing about the degrees of vertices. I wanted to, to make sure that I, uh, that I sample things only with uh, something that is proportionate to their degree. And the way I did that was I waited until uh, components are uh, big enough in comparison in, uh, with respect to all of the degrees we mean. What I failed to, to acknowledge when I said that, is that I remove edges from the graph. Right? Because if this uh, growing step fails, I remove edges. But when I remove edges, I also change the degrees of vertices that are still in the graph, that are still going to participate in growing steps. These are vertices that are not in the removed component, but are neighbors of vertices in the removed component. So it could be that I have a vertex that is of very high degree, but sometime in the middle of, uh, of my process, I would think that it is a vertex of a very low degree because it would have only a few uh, neighbors remaining at that, uh, at that uh, time point, which would be very problematic because then I could think that I have a component that is very small and sample things with probability that is very high. This is k over the size of this component. But actually, the, the vertex uh, in this uh, component is of a very high degree, and if I would sample every edge coming out of it with a uh, with a probability that, that is proportionate to a very small component, I would sample a lot of neighbors, which is something I don't want to do. So this is a problem. And the way we deal with this problem is to add another step. We're going to call a trimming step after each growing step. What is that trimming step? 
So after each growing step, I'm going to look at all vertices that remain in my graph. And for each vertex, I would check how many of its neighbors I removed already, how many of its edges I already removed from the graph. And if I see that any vertex has more than two thirds of its, ver of its uh, edges removed, then I'm just going to remove all of them. And then I will iteratively continue doing so. So this type of training step can, can cause more training steps and more training steps and so on. I just want to have the property that always in my uh, current graph, the graph after I removed some of the edges, the degrees are up to a constant factor the same as they were in the original graph because then the problem I just mentioned would not exist. So I want to have this, uh, this property and in order to enforce that property I'm doing that. I make sure that if two thirds of your edges are removed then all of them are. And now the question is how much did that cost me? So I would want to argue that I increased the number of removed edges by at most a constant factor, not more than that. Why is that true? We can see that, for example, uh, using the, the following uh, another like uh, amortized type argument. So each time I remove an edge, I'm going to pay two coins and leave these coins on the two endpoints of the edge. What are these coins? So these coins are going to be coins that I would use in the future, in the trimming steps, to remove edges with. Like every time I would remove an edge in a trimming step, I would have to pay this, uh, this uh, type of coin in order to remove it. And that would mean that if in any real removal, in any removal during the growing step, I removed an edge and paid two coins for it, and I would only be able to remove edges in trimming steps by paying a coin to removing them, then the number of edges that would be removed in uh, trimming steps would be at most twice the number of edges that are removed in growing steps. Because I pay ahead for, for, uh, for the uh, removal. And why are these two coins enough? Because now when I need to trim a vertex, when I have a vertex for which at least two thirds of the edges are already removed, then I would have the invariant that I have at least two third uh, degree of v-coins waiting in this vertex, right? Because every time I remove an edge, I put a coin in, uh, in both of its uh, endpoints. And now, how am I going to use this uh, two third uh, degree of v-coins? Then I would use half of them. I would use a uh, first the degree of uh, v coins in order to remove the rest of the edges but in order to maintain my invariant I would also need to take the second half of the coins and put them on the neighbors on the neighbors of the edges I remove because I want to keep the invariant that every removed edge left a coin in, a, in, its, in each of its uh, active uh, endpoints so having twice as many coins as the edges I want to remove is enough the minute uh, one of the nodes is not active anymore so this proof shows that the number of edges I'm going to remove in training steps is at most twice the amount of edges I'm removing in growing steps, which means that this problem is, uh, is solved. I, 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 now I don't need to, to care about the degrees getting too low, because now I can assume that the degrees at every, uh, at every point throughout my process are within a constant factor of the original degrees. Um, and that's the entire simplified uh, proof. I would stress out that I did leave out uh, maybe even like the main challenges, like getting rid of uh, this logarithmic factor and then trying to get a case smaller than uh, the log n or still, uh, still maybe most of the, the technical work, but the framework of the proof is very similar. Like this is the, like the, the Aiming step and the growing smaller uh, components and this uh, algorithmic fashion of the, of the proof. This is uh, what happens also in the more, uh, more uh, general ones when you want to get below log n, then you need also to do something about high degree components, obviously, because uh, then, then you would not uh, be able to suffer this cost of uh, log n neighbors per uh, vertex. But uh, hopefully this, this gives you enough to, uh, at least if you're interested, keep talking with me about that. And obviously the main, uh, the main open challenge left here is to see what is the smallest k for which this is true.
and we think we can show it for log log n now, but you need to, to be able to say what happens about very small case. For example, we don't have any lower bound except of, uh, of uh, the case of k equals 1. Uh, it is easy because even in the, in the complete graph, nothing uh, interesting is happening. Then it is very interesting to, to see, even for the example of k equals 2, if you can build some type of uh, lower bound, or obviously if you can prove it, then uh, it's fantastic. Uh, another open thing is more applications. So we have what I showed. There is also one other uh, somewhat uh, an application of that in a subsequent paper, but uh, it is interesting to see if it can be used for more things. And I think this is everything I wanted to say about that. I'm almost in time. All right, great. All right, uh, yeah, Chris, maybe wait a bit, second. I wonder if that is... Uh, uh, no, I should, so, oh. You ask about that, well, maybe they... <laughs> are there questions to all from the Zoom crowd? Oh, they all have a question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I just wonder, I mean, you believe the uh, constant is uh, it is still true for k equals constant here we come? Uh, I tend to believe it does. Uh, we can, I mean, we still need to fully verify that, but we think that with a constant k, we can get like something more similar to the simplified result. Like still getting uh, it, it to get something like n, even even maybe n log log n edges with a constant, large constant okay, yeah. k. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't still see any any convincing reason to believe it stops at uh, at some point. But uh, I mean, I would not fall out of my chair, especially not if you would be able to show that the the possible constant is not uh, two, but uh, whatever larger than that. Yeah, it's possible that uh, you can. Uh, do a k out model and you are left only with n over root k or something like this. Really, I mean, and yeah. the, the, I think the striking thing about your results is that you are left with just some linear number. Yeah, that's so, right. So it's possible. The question is whether you can, with a constant k, get a sublinear. So with a constant k, you would not be able to get something sublinear because you know that you would be, I mean, we have seen that for any k, you have this lower bound of n over k, so if k is constant, this is still a linear. No, no, that is sublinear for me. For me, sublinear is below n. Okay. I mean, yeah. below n, that's a striking thing compared okay. to yes, the so KKT so analysis. In, in that sense. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe if you want to put it, uh, you know, as you talk, you say, to get epsilon n, in the cards, you need to pay k, which is a function of epsilon. I don't care. Yeah, I agree. I agree. This would be, would be really very, interesting. very interesting. Yes. More questions? All right, lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much.